Everybody is excited about Christopher Nolan's film Oppenheimer, but it is not the film that I want to speak with you about today. Rather, I want to speak with you about a line from the Bhagavad Gita that Oppenheimer remembered when the first atomic explosion took place. Why did he remember this line? And are we correctly interpreting this line from the Bhagavad Gita? The famous line from the Bhagavad Gita that Oppenheimer remembered when the first atomic explosion took place has been misinterpreted and mistranslated many times. But we want to get to the bottom of the meaning today. But first, I want to mention to you the interview that this came from in 1965, where Oppenheimer explained remembering this verse from the Bhagavad Gita. We knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed. A few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu was trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty, and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. So let's unpack this quote. First of all, Oppenheimer mentions the prince. Now the prince in the Bhagavad Gita is Arjuna, and he mentions also Vishnu. And Vishnu is the Godhead, right? The Godhead here is the ultimate Brahman. So in India, there's the Vaishnava tradition, which are worshippers of Vishnu. And then there's the Shaiva tradition, which are worshippers of Shiva. And so the Bhagavad Gita is a Vaishnava text. So Vishnu is a representation of Brahman, the ultimate reality. Don't confuse this with Brahma, the creative god. So when you've got the Trimurti, you've got Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver or the sustainer, and then Shiva, the destroyer. So you've got this Trimurti, right? For whatever reason, there isn't much of a Brahma tradition, but there is a Vishnu and Shiva tradition mainly in India. And Brahman is the ultimate reality. That ultimate one non-dual consciousness that we all are and so Vishnu is a representation of that and an incarnation of Vishnu is Krishna in the story so Krishna is Vishnu in human form trying to persuade Arjuna actually to go into battle against his cousins in the famous Kurukshetra war in the Bhagavad Gita now the Bhagavad Gita makes up a smaller part of a greater text the Mahabharata and so that's who Vishnu and Arjuna are in the story. Another thing to remember in this quote, when Krishna mentions death, he's speaking about Kala because it's actually Kala in Sanskrit. Now, Kala can mean death and or time in some sense. And so that could be world destroying time or the death of the world or the destroyer of worlds, as it's said in the translation that Oppenheimer stated. So in the Bhagavad Gita, this story between Krishna and Arjuna is really a spiritual story and it has a meaning and significance for each and every one of us. And one of the core principles in the Bhagavad Gita is Nishkarma Karma. So Nishkarma Karma means not being attached to the fruits of your own action. And so to do this, you need to follow your Dharma. Now your Dharma is sort of your divine duty, what you've been endowed with to bring into the world. And so in the story, Arjuna is a Kshatriya. Now Kshatriya is the warrior group in India. And so he was a warrior. And so his dharma is actually to be a warrior and to go into battle without any ego or self-interest. That's what Nishkarma Karma is. And that's where it comes in, is that you ought to act out the divine will because the concept in the Bhagavad Gita and all through Hinduism is that there's only really one consciousness and that one consciousness is moving through each and every one of us and that is Brahman and in this story it is Vishnu who is moving through everyone and so you see in the story that Vishnu shows his multifaceted form to Arjuna and Arjuna is just completely blown away and so that's the absolute one consciousness that we all are. And so another concept to think about in relation to this is Leela. Now, Leela means the divine play. Now, Krishna is trying to explain to Arjuna that this is all the one consciousness expressing itself, and it's only your subjectivity that prevents you from fulfilling your dharma because he is still operating from a personality, an ego, in Sanskrit, what we would call a jiva. 
And so he's still operating from a jiva. He is not completely free. The opposite side of the coin, so to speak, is the Atman, the undifferentiated consciousness, which is identical with Brahman, the ultimate reality. And so when you abide in the Atman, you fulfill your divine duty, your divine virtue in this world. And so then you take your part in this Leela and this divine play. And so Arjuna has to realize that it's just the one consciousness moving through everything, even through his cousins that he's going into battle against. It's still moving through them. The point is to come to that understanding. That's what Krishna is trying to explain to Arjuna, that you need to fulfill your duty without this sense of jiva, this sense of self, and then everything takes care of itself and then you don't suffer and, and you are not attached to the course of your actions. It's just Vishnu expressing itself, moving through everyone. It's that one ultimate reality. I remember a quote by Ramana Maharshi where he said, Whatever is destined not to happen will not happen. Try as you may. Whatever is destined to happen will happen. Do what you may to prevent it. This is certain. The best course, therefore, is to remain silent. Now, Ramana Maharshi being a great non-dual master, Advaita Vedanta master, he understands this line perfectly. He understands Nishkarma Karma, Leela. He understands the one will of the ultimate moving through all. He understands all of this, and this is why he expressed those words. Try as you may, it will be as it will be. And so we only suffer as a jiva when we try to make life bend to our will when ultimately our will is subject to the ultimate will. And so the point of the story is, is moving your ego aside so that you can allow life to be as it will. This is the higher teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, which are actually similar to Taoism because of the concept of Wu Wei which is the path of non-interference, of allowing life to be as it will without your own subjective viewpoint interfering with the way the world is. Because often when we operate from our own subjective viewpoint, we have an agenda and we push that onto the world. And Krishna is trying to teach Arjuna not to have any agendas. He wants him just to fulfill his dharma and that's it. And so that brings me to another concept within Hinduism, which is ahimsa, which is non-violence and non-harming. And now some people will say that this story goes against that, but you have to understand this in its proper context as well, right? Some people will take the story literal. Some people will take it as metaphor. It doesn't matter. You still need to understand the concept of ahimsa in relation to this story because in this sense, whatever is your dharma, your divine duty, cannot be violent because you are actually acting out the will of the divine. It's only when you have a subjective self-interested perspective that you push onto others, that's when it becomes violent, right? And so that's one of the points. That's why in some old Vedic rituals, you'll see animal sacrifices and this and that, and it wasn't considered actually violent or harming because it was a ritual in offering to the ultimate reality. And so they never saw it as violent. So you have to understand that in its proper context, right? Your dharma cannot be violent according to Sanatana Dharma, according to the eternal natural way. And so that doesn't mean everything we do is right, right? Like So like I said, if we're doing it from a self-interested perspective, if there's an agenda, then that can lead to harming oneself or harming others. And so it's debatable whether Oppenheimer saw it from that perspective. And I'm not really here to judge him. I just wanted to explain to you all the hidden meaning and understanding of this quote, right? As Vishnu says in the form of Krishna, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. So it does not matter what you do. It's only the will of the divine that's taking place. We have all of these stories in our mind as to why things happen, why things don't happen, and it's above our pay grade. It's all the one will is what the point of the Bhagavad Gita is. It's moving all through us. So Arjuna just had to realize that he had to go into battle. That's his dharma, that's his duty, and what will be will be. Right, And so why did Oppenheimer remember this line when the first atomic explosion happened? Well, only he could probably answer that. We could only speculate, and we're not really here to judge the men. But what we could say is that in some sense, he probably regrets his technological innovation because 
he failed to consider its ramifications, right? And look, there's been many innovations and many things done all throughout history by many people where they probably regret their actions because of what it leads to. But in some sense, how could you know in that point in time? Well, maybe in his situation, that was different because an atomic bomb is an atomic bomb, right? But as I said, only probably he could know, really. And so another thing to think about is that this film is probably very timely right at this moment. I don't know if Christopher Nolan intended it to be that way, because just as Oppenheimer regretted his own technological innovation, Silicon Valley might regret their own interest in technological innovation in regards to artificial intelligence. We don't know the potential of artificial intelligence at the moment, but we can speculate on the dangers of it and how it will take away a lot from humanity, creativity, our own working environment, everything. Like there'll be far more people unemployed. You know, we can speculate about all of this, right? And so Silicon Valley have to be very careful when they talk about their interests in artificial intelligence. And in saying that, Silicon Valley might regret a lot of things that they've created, particularly social media. It's taken a lot away from people, community, and has contributed to a lot of conflict and violence around the world. But it also has brought a lot of people together. There's two sides of the coin there, right? But so they might also regret some of that as well. And so this film probably is very timely. And as I said, I'm not sure if Nolan intended that or not, or it's just a coincidence. But that's the way it is nevertheless. And as with Silicon Valley and the potential dangers of AI, I speak about that a lot in my book, Spiritual Freedom in the Digital Age, and also my documentary, The Yugas, where I speak about the relationship between the Kali Yuga and transhumanism and artificial intelligence and all of these other future technologies. And so that's just something very interesting to think about, right? It's very interesting to think about the dangers of all of this potential technology that Oppenheimer himself was witness to. He experienced that personally, right? And so I'm not sure if the Bhagavad Gita gave him any solace in that, but it's interesting to consider that he had a deep love for Hindu scriptures and he remembered this particular line when the first atomic explosion happened. So now that you understand this line from the Bhagavad Gita in its proper context, and you also understand that Oppenheimer had a deep love for Hindu scriptures, do you think Oppenheimer thought of himself as Arjuna to justify his actions? Now that's something interesting to think about, and I'll leave that up to you to decide. But one thing is for sure, unlike Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, there is no hero in this story. Shanti, shanti, shanti.